Want to speak real Hebrew from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at HebrewPod101.com. Hi, everybody. Yana here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, just what is the difference between Biblical and Modern Hebrew? Now, you may be attracted to Hebrew for any number of reasons. Perhaps you want to communicate with friends or family, or maybe you have interested in studying the many religious and classical texts written in Hebrew. Depending on your reasons for learning Hebrew, you may end up learning one of two very different languages. Biblical or Classical Hebrew was an ancient language that first emerged in the 10th century BC. Over the next centuries, the ancient Hebrew people used it to communicate and to take a record of their history, religion, philosophy, poetry, and culture. A portion of this literary record formed the basis of Hebrew scriptures and also what came to be called the Bible. During the Roman period, the language evolved beyond recognition and later fell out of use in daily life, but it lived on in religious contexts. Hebrew experienced a revival in the late 19th century as part of the larger Zionist movement. Thanks to the effort of Eliezer ben Yehuda, who prepared the first modern Hebrew dictionary, people started using Hebrew again to communicate with one another as they went about their lives. But because of the influence of European languages, Hebrew changed. Grammar, pronunciation, vocabulary, not a single aspect of the language went untouched by the transformation. And like any other modern language, Hebrew continues to change. So, for example, the word I or me in Biblical Hebrew is Anochi. This same word has changed in modern Hebrew to Ani. Besides this change in pronunciation, modern Hebrew got a lot of new words from languages like French and German. For example, the word concrete or beton came from French, while schnitzel or schnitzel came from German. And of course, there are new words to describe things that did not exist in ancient times, like electricity, chashmal, computer, machshev, car, mechonit, telephone, telephone. At this point in history, someone familiar only with Biblical Hebrew would not be able to communicate very well with contemporary native speakers. At the same time, a modern Hebrew speaker cannot easily read the Bible. How was it? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Lehi Traot! Hi everybody, Yana here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, how can you possibly read Hebrew if it doesn't have any vowels? The simple answer to this question is that people who are fluent in Hebrew know which vowels go with different words. For someone who knows any language well, it's really not as hard as it sounds. Try it. Here's a famous quote in English translation, which the vowels removed. Take a minute to read this. Can you figure it out? That which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. Was it easier than you thought? Most English speakers don't practice this skill much, but imagine if you did this all the time. In reality, there are a few characters used sometimes to indicate vowel sounds in Hebrew, and even native speakers use them. I'll explain more about this in a later lesson. You now know how native speakers can read Hebrew without vowels. But what about Hebrew learners? There are a couple systems available to help non-native or beginner speakers read Hebrew text. The most common of these is the Nikud. Here's an example. Do you see these dots and marks? They represent the vowel sounds and are called Nikud. We go over this system in more detail in our Hebrew Alphabet Made Easy series. But for now, take comfort that there is help. There is also a number of systems of Roman transliteration. These almost always include vowels to help you read. For example, the sentence above can be read Toch mispar shavuot 
החנות נסגרה. All beginner materials at hebrewpod101.com include this kind of romanization. How was it? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Lehi Taot! Hi everybody, Yana here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what is the difference between handwritten and printed Hebrew? You may be familiar with printed Hebrew from books, magazines, or newspapers. But if you've ever gotten a handwritten note from your Hebrew-speaking friend, colleague, or loved one, you may have thought that Hebrew looked really different. This is because just as English has handwritten and cursive letters that differ from their print forms, Hebrew has its own separate systems for writing by hand and for printing. The print version is sometimes called Assyrian script, square script, or block print. These letters have a kind of square, angular shape with sharp edges, for example. Handwritten script is much curvier and flows more easily when written with a pen or a pencil on a piece of paper, for example. Please note, though, that handwritten Hebrew letters do not join the way cursive does in English. Check out our writing series, The Hebrew Alphabet Made Easy, for more information. There, I teach you how to create both block and handwritten versions of each and every letter. How was it? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Lehi Hi everybody, Yana here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what's the difference between Nikud and Ktiv Male systems of writing vowels? And which one should I learn? Let's start at the beginning. Originally, Hebrew was written without any vowels or vowel symbols at all. All the letters were consonants. This is called Ktiv Chaser, and you may be familiar with it if you've seen the Torah written out in its original form. Reading this can be very challenging for people new to Hebrew or unfamiliar with the vocabulary in a given text. Because of this, Ktiv Menukad was introduced. Ktiv Menukad involves a series of dots and other forms of notation called Nikud. They are added to words and fully represent their vowel sounds. You'll see this writing system in language textbooks, as well as in children's books or poetry. But for people who know Hebrew well or who use it in their everyday life, this Ktiv Menukad is very labor-intensive and inconvenient. The Academy of the Hebrew Language has established a set of rules to write without Nikud, but still indicate some vowels using the letters Aleph, He, Vav, and Yud. This is commonly called Ktiv Male, and it's the most widely used writing system in Israel today. You'll see it in newspapers, books, on signs, and in TV subtitles. Here is an example of a word, Shulchan, written with the three different systems. When learning Hebrew, you should study all of these systems to some degree. When starting out, you can use the Ktiv Menukad to help you develop your pronunciation and build your vocabulary. As you become a more proficient Hebrew user, though, you'll want to get familiar with Ktiv Male, as this will be the most common system you'll use as an adult in your everyday life. In fact, it's becoming more common recently to teach Hebrew with Ktiv Male and skip Ktiv Menukad altogether. How was it? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Lehi Traut! Hi everybody, Yana here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what's the difference between the Nikud Kamatz and patach, and between tsere and segol. To understand this, it's important to know that vowels in Hebrew were traditionally of three lengths. Some vowels were long, some short, and some super short. Kamatz and patach both represent an a sound, but kamatz is long while patach is short. Here are a few examples. Shalom, 
קל. Some words have both קמץ and פתח. כתב, גנב, מצא. Similarly, צרה is the long version of the a sound, while סגול is the short version. Here are a few examples. לב, עץ, מועד, מלך, כרמל. In the past, knowing the difference between these sounds was crucial to speaking and understanding proper Hebrew. But in contemporary Hebrew, there is no difference at all. That's right, they all sound exactly the same. How do you know then which one to use? Since they have no impact on pronunciation, the only real way to learn the proper spelling and use of the Nikud is simply by memorizing it. As you study Hebrew, you may start to recognize patterns that make this easier. But on the whole, there are no shortcuts. How was it? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hi everybody, Yana here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, how can one know if a word is written with the letter tet or taf, with kuf or kaf? with bet or vav, with sin or samech, and why are they needed if they represent the same sounds? Like some of the other questions I've answered on Ask a Teacher, the confusion here is due in part to the long history of the Hebrew language. In ancient Hebrew, each one of these letters stood for a different sound. For example, mo'adim, anochi. As time went on though, This distinction became less important, and each one of these pairs came to have more or less the same sound. So, the letters tet, or taf, came to have the t sound. Kuf, or kaf, the k sound. And vet, and vav, the v sound. Sin and samech, the s sound. Because this amounts to a simple spelling rule, There are no real shortcuts to learning, besides memorizing words as they come up. You'll get the hang of it soon though. How was it? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher. Well, I answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is... What does the Hebrew word et mean? And when do you use it? The Hebrew language has a unique syntax and it can be quite confusing. One of the words that is used very frequently in Hebrew sentences is et, a word that has no equivalent in the English language. It is a preposition used to introduce a direct object. The word et is used between a verb and the direct object it refers to. For example, to take the medicine, lakachat et hatrufa. To find the keys, למצוא את המפתחות. Et is also used when the direct object is a proper noun, people, places, or organizations, or a personal pronoun such as I or you. When using personal pronouns, it is incorporated into the form of et. For example, to hug him, לחבק אותו, et plus who. To visit her, לבקר אותה. את פלוס היא. To hide them, להחביא אותם. את פלוס הם. To move you, להזיז אותך. את פלוס you. The situation is different if the direct object is indefinite. By this I mean, the object is somehow unspecified or has no known owner. In English, we usually use the article A when we talk about indefinite objects. For example, we say a banana instead of the banana when we're not talking about a particular banana. When this happens, et is simply dropped and no other preposition is used instead. For example, to find a random set of keys is to find keys. How was that? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Leitraot! Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The questions for this lesson is... 
What is the meaning of the word davka? The word davka has no equivalent in the English language. It can be quite confusing for people who try to look up in the dictionary. However, it is similar to the English word spite and can be used in a variety of ways in Hebrew. Like many other words in modern Hebrew, the word davka came from the Aramic language. In Aramic, it means precision or meticulousness. In modern Hebrew, it has a few different meanings depending on the context of the sentence. However, its meanings are always related to the original definition in some way. It can mean precisely, but mostly it in an ironic or sarcastic kind of way. For example, Don't go there. That place is always crowded. That is precisely why I want to go. Davka bigal ze ani rotsa lalechet. Davka. Because of that reason, I want to go. You can also use davka to mean out of spite. This shows that I'm doing this action in order to make someone else angry or upset. For example, I love that vase. Why did you break it? Davka. Out of spite. Another common expression in Hebrew is la sot davka, which means to act out of spite in a childish way. Ha'orim sheli ratzu shel mad refua. אז הלכתי ללמוד אומנות כדי לעשות להם דווקא. My parents wanted me to study medicine, so I studied art to do דווקא, or spite them. How was it? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below, and I'll try to answer them. להתראות! Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is... Are there dialects in Hebrew? Modern Israeli Hebrew has no geographical dialects, but there are some features of the language that change between different social or ethnic groups, expressed mainly in the pronunciation of guttural consonants. Hebrew was a frozen language for 17 centuries. It was used mostly for liturgical purposes and was not a spoken language. Towards the end of the 19th century started a process called the revival of the Hebrew language. It took place in Europe and Palestine and changed the usage of Hebrew from a sacred language to a spoken one, the one used for daily life in Israel. In the beginning of this process, there were mainly three groups of Hebrew regional accents, Ashkenazi, spoken by Jews from Eastern Europe, Sephardi, spoken by Jews from Spain, Brazil, Portugal, and Italy, and Mizrahi, spoken by Jews from the Middle East. As the process went on, Features of the different kind of pronunciation merged, and today's spoken Hebrew has two main varieties, oriental and non-oriental, that differ mainly in the pronunciation of the consonants ein, chet, and reish. In short, an Israeli whose parents came from Yemen sounds a little different than an Israeli whose parents came from Russia, but in further generations, the accent normalizes to more standard modern Hebrew accent. How was it? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later out! Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, why is it that counting nouns in Hebrew, the counted noun is sometimes referred to as singular, even if there's more than one? You may have heard the common Hebrew birthday greeting, Ad me'avesrim shana, meaning, May you live to be 120, or literally, until 120 years. If you have, you probably wondered why the word for year, shana, is in its singular form and not its plural form, shanim. The reason for this is a rule regarding Hebrew counting. When counting a noun in Hebrew, if you have more than 10 of the same item, you can refer to the items as singular or as plural. It's your choice. Ten items or fewer will always be plural. For example, 50 shekels could be either 50 shkalim or 50 shekel. And 75 people could either be 75 anashim or 75 ish. But nine years can only be teisha shanim and 5% can only be chamisha achuzim. However, despite this rule, 
Using the singular form for counting is common only with nouns that are counted frequently, like money, units of time such as hours, days and years, or percents. It's unlikely to hear someone say, יש עשרים ציפור על העץ. It's like saying there are 20 bird on the tree. If you're unsure, you can just use the plural form with numbers except one. It will always be appropriate. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later out! Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is... How can I tell what the plural forms of Hebrew nouns are? In order to understand plural nouns, you'll need to learn how nouns in Hebrew work first. All nouns are either masculine or feminine, and their gender depends on the last letter of the Hebrew word. Sounds confusing? Don't worry, we'll break it down in this lesson. Most feminine nouns end in the letters taf, t, or he, h, while most masculine nouns end in any other letter. The plural form of the nouns is just as easy to remember. The basic rule is that feminine nouns change the last letter to the letters vav taf, ot, while masculine nouns get an extra yod mem at the end, im. Let's do some examples so you can learn how to make plural nouns correctly in Hebrew. First, let's take the word lamp, which in Hebrew is menorah. Lamp ends in he, so it's feminine. To make a feminine noun plural, we simply remove the he and add vav taf, ot, and get the word menorot, meaning lamps. Let's do another example with a masculine noun. The word for bag in Hebrew is tik. Tik is a masculine noun, so we just add yud mem, im, at the end and we get tikim, meaning bags. So far, so good. But of course, there are some exceptions. Some nouns get the opposite gender ending in the plural form. For example, the word ant in Hebrew is nemala. It ends in he. And like most of the nouns that end in this letter, it's a feminine noun. However, in the plural form, it takes on the masculine ending. So it sounds like this, nemalim, meaning ants. Another example is the word table, which in Hebrew is shulchan. Here, it's the opposite. Table is a masculine noun, but in the plural form, it takes the feminine ending, making the word shulchanot, tables. Unfortunately, there is no rule to help you figure out which are the exceptions to the rule. Hebrew learners just have to memorize them. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later out! Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what does the Hebrew expression Rosh Katan mean? The expression Rosh Katan literally means small head and is used to describe a person who only does the bare minimum or doesn't think outside the box. It's mostly a negative expression, but you can also use it to describe yourself, like this. Literally, I prefer to be a small head. The opposite expression is Rosh Gadol, meaning big head. This describes a person who makes an effort to go above and beyond what is expected of him. It's a positive attribute and is often seen in job advertisements as something companies are looking for in a candidate. This expression can also appear in a different form as a verb. Lagdil Rosh to make one's head larger or to expand one's head. You can use this expression if you want to say that a certain person is very responsible and will go out of their way to think outside the box and find creative solutions. Here are a few examples. Anati menahelet metsuyenet. Hitamid magdila rosh. Literally, Anati is an excellent manager. She always expands her head. Here is another example. Itai. אם אתה רוצה להתקדם בחברה, אתה חייב להתחיל להגדיל ראש. Literally, איתי, if you want to rise in the company racks, you have to start expanding your head. Do you know any other Hebrew idioms? Tell us in the comments. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. 
להתראות. היי אבריבדי, אידית היר, וולקום טו אסקה טיצ'ר, וואר אה אנסר סאם אוף יור מוסט קומן היברו קוויסטיונס. The question for this lesson is, what does the word נורא mean and how should it be used? The word נורא has gone through some interesting changes over the years. It appears in the Bible, meaning awesome or awe-inspiring, in reference to God. You can say it in this sentence from the book of Deuteronomy, האל הגדול, הגיבור והנורא, which means the great and mighty and awesome God. In modern-day Hebrew, the meaning of the word נורא has lost its positive aspects and become more about the fear-inducing aspects, become an adjective meaning terrible or awful, like in these examples. הסרט היה נורא. The movie was awful. Or in this one. זו הייתה חוויה נוראה. It was a horrible experience. The word נורא also appears in the expression לא נורא. meaning something like, it's okay, or it's not a big deal. Let's look at this example. Say you're with your roommate and you're on your way home. When you check your bag, you realize you forgot your keys. Your roommate could say, שכחת את המפתחות? לא נורא, יש לי מפתח. You forgot the keys? It's okay, I have a key. The word נורא can also be used as an adverb meaning very or terribly. It can be added to negative adjectives, but also to positive adjectives like נורא יפה, terribly beautiful, or נורא מעניין, very interesting. It can appear either before or after the adjective. One important thing to note is that this use of the word נורא is colloquial and shouldn't be used in formal situations. So next time you're with your Israeli friends, try using the word נורא with one of the many expressions we've learned in this lesson and see how you sound. How is this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later on. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what does the particle E mean in Hebrew? E is a prefix symbolizing negation. It comes from the word En, literally meaning there is no. When this prefix is joined with certain words, the compound means the opposite of the original word. As you may know, nouns in Hebrew have gender. So if you add a prefix to it, how do you know what gender it is? Trick question. Actually, the prefix doesn't affect the gender of the word it precedes. Let's look at some examples. The word Havana means understanding. So, E Havana is misunderstanding. Like in this sentence, אני מתנצלת, זו הייתה אי הבנה. I apologize, it was a misunderstanding. The noun understanding, הבנה, is a feminine noun. When adding אי to it, the gender doesn't change. This is why we use the feminine form of it was, זו הייתה. Next, we have the word justice, which in Hebrew is צדק. So, when we combine it with the prefix אי, It becomes E tzedek, injustice, like in this sentence. מדיניות הממשלה יוצרת E tzedek חברתי. The government's policy is creating social injustice. The noun justice, tzedek, is masculine and wasn't changed by the prefix E. This is why the adjective social, חברתי, takes the masculine form. Our last tip is about the plural form. Once again, the prefix has no influence on the gender of the word. The word will take its plural form, if it has one, and the prefix will stay where it is. For example, let's look at the compound from the beginning of this lesson. Misunderstanding. Understanding is Havana. So, misunderstanding will be E Havana. The plural form of understanding is Havanot. So, the plural form of misunderstanding is Havana. E have a not. How was it? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later on. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, why is it that in Hebrew some adjectives are different when they refer to people than when they refer to objects? 
This issue involves adjectives in their feminine form, mostly adjectives for nationality like American or Russian. The difference is in the ending of the adjectives. It can either be with it or with ya. For example, a Russian woman would be isha rusia, but a Russian boat will be svina rusit. So why does this happen? First of all, it's important to know that both forms of these adjectives are commonly used, but in different contexts. Usually the ending ya, like in rusia, Russian woman, is used to refer to a woman, while the ending it, like in rusit, Russian boat, is used to describe places or objects, such as a restaurant, a shirt, or the Russian language. Grammatically speaking, both forms are acceptable. The foundation of Hebrew grammar is the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, in which we find both of those forms used for all purposes. In the Tanakh, the feminine ending, ya, describes women, but also objects or places, like in the word nukhriya, meaning foreign. Some examples with this word would be Anuchi nukhriya, I am foreign, and Be'eretz nukhriya, in a foreign country. Besides the ending ya, there is the ending it, also used in the Tanakh for both people and objects. For example, Isha Mitzrit, Egyptian woman. Dlat Mitzrit, Egyptian pumpkin. We can even find both endings for the same definition. Ruth HaMoavia, Ruth the Moabite, Ruth from the kingdom of Moab. Shimrit HaMoavit, Shimrit the Moabite, Shimrit from the kingdom of Moab. However, as I said earlier, in today's Hebrew there is usually a difference between the two forms. This rule doesn't apply only to nationalities but to other adjectives as well. Let's look at some examples. Ishadatiya, religious woman. Shkunadatit, religious neighborhood. Ishachufshia, free woman. Tznichachufshit, free falling, which more naturally translates as skydiving. Since this is not a set rule but rather a differentiation used in more common language, sometimes the ending it is used for a woman too like in these examples. Secular woman, Chilonit. Iranian woman, Iranit. Israeli woman, Israelit. Confused? Well, there are some good news. Regardless of the singular form, the plural form will always stay the same, Yot. For example, let's look at some adjectives that are used when referring to a woman. As you may know, the adjective has to agree with the noun in both gender and number. Rusiot, Russian. Datiot, religious. Chofshiot, free. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Leitot! Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, why is the word panim, face in Hebrew, plural? This question has to do with an interesting phenomenon in the Hebrew language. There are a few nouns in Hebrew which are plural in their grammatical form, but singular conceptually. Sound confusing? Let's break it down. The four main nouns that are singular but plural grammatically are life, chaim, water, maim, and sky, shamaim. In addition to the noun form, this lesson's question, panim. As you can see, all of these words have typical plural masculine endings, im. Grammatically speaking, these words are plural. They don't have a singular form, and the adjectives attached to them will take a plural form as well. Some examples would be chaim arukim, long life, maim chamim, hot water, shamaim meunanim, cloudy sky, panim yafim, or yafot, pretty face. This noun is both feminine and masculine. So why are these words plural? There is no definite answer to this question, but there are a few interesting theories. One of those theories suggests that these words are plural because all of these nouns are constantly changing. Each of them is one noun that actually has many forms and cannot be captured by a singular noun. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later.
Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, how do you use the Hebrew preposition al? The Hebrew word al has many uses. It can mean on, about, of, at, or for, depending on the context. Let's go through some examples so you can learn how to use al correctly. First, let's do some examples for when al means on. יש ארנק על השולחן. There is a wallet on the table. התמונה תלויה על הקיר. The picture is hanging on the wall. Here are some examples of the word על when it means about or of. אנחנו צריכים לדבר על זה. We need to talk about this. לא שמעתי על הסרט הזה. I haven't heard of this movie. The word על is also used as at to indicate a direction like in this sentence. תסתכלי על האיש הזה. Look at that man. It can also be used as for to indicate purpose or consideration. תודה על המתנה. Thank you for the present. הוא נענש על הפשע שביצע. He was punished for the crime he committed. The word על can also be conjugated in a few ways depending on the subject it's referring to. These conjugations are created by combining the preposition על with a pronoun such as I or you. These conjugations are needed in case the word al is referring to a person not being mentioned by name. For example, if we said, I'm thinking about him, instead of, I'm thinking about Ben. Likewise, it can also be conjugated for objects without explicitly stating them. For example, the book is on it, instead of, the book is on the shelf. Here are a few examples for conjugations of the word al. Siparti lachalea. I told you about her. אין מקום על השולחן, יש עליו ספרים. There is no room on the table, it has books on it. אתה יכול להסתכל על הרהיטים, אבל אל תישען עליהם. Literally, you can look at the furniture, but don't lean on them. כל הקפה נשפך עליי. All the coffee was spilled on me. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what does the expression al regel achat mean? This expression, meaning literally on one foot, is very common in Hebrew, and many people use it without even knowing its origin. Basically, it's used to describe something that's done offhandedly with no previous thought or preparation. But where did it come from? The origin of this expression, like many other Hebrew expressions, is a story from the Talmud, a central text of Rabbinic Judaism. The story revolves around the great Talmudic sage Hillel, also known as Hillel the Elder, one of the most important figures in Jewish history. Hillel was a famous scholar known for his gentleness and patience. In the Talmud, Hillel is often mentioned together with his colleague Shammai. The two scholars often disagreed on the interpretations of Torah law. While Shammai tended to follow the stricter interpretation, Hillel considered love of men as the core of Jewish teaching. Our story is about a man who wanted to convert to Judaism, but didn't really want to put in the time or effort to do so. This man went to Shammai with one request. He wanted Shammai to teach him the entire Torah while he, the student, was standing on one foot. Shammai was insulted by the man's ridiculous request, since the Torah is deep, profound and complex, and cannot be taught in the short time in which a person can stand on one foot. When Shammai threw him out of the house, the man went to Hillel. He asked him for the same thing. Hillel accepted the challenge and told the man, What is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That's the whole Torah. The rest of the explanation of this, go and study it. The story teaches us the special virtues of Hillel and of the Torah, and it's also the source of the expression, Al Regel Achat, on one foot. Today, you can use this expression when you want to imply that something is done briefly, without much thought behind it. For example, if you want to say that an issue is very complicated and cannot be solved easily, you can say, It's a complicated issue, it cannot be resolved on one foot. Or, if you just gave someone the short, undetailed version of a complicated matter, you can say, That's the whole story on one foot. 
You can also find this expression in introductory articles and books that explain complicated issues in an accessible way. Something like Guides for Dummies. For example, the title of an article about economics that try to simplify the basics of it could be Kalkala al regel achat, Economy on one foot. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later on. Hi everybody, Dit here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher. Well, I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what is the construct state smichut and what are its rules? The smichut construct is very confusing since it can alter the forms of words and change all kinds of grammatical rules. Let's try to make it clearer. So what is smichut anyway? Basically, it's a way of expressing of in Hebrew and it consists of two words side by side that create a noun. Let's go through some examples so you can learn how to use smichut correctly. Let's look at a simple example. The compound water bottle. A water bottle is a bottle of water. In this compound, the main noun is the second word, the bottle. And the first word describes the noun. In Hebrew, it will be pretty much the same, except that the first word will be the main noun and the second will be the description. So, in Hebrew, water bottle will be bakbuk maim. Bakbuk meaning bottle and maim meaning water. Some compounds combine two nouns to create a completely different noun. For example, the word weather in Hebrew is the compound mezeg avir. The word mezeg means temper and avir means air. So literally, this compound means air temper. In some cases, the singular form of a compound can include a plural noun. For example, the compound dog trainer in Hebrew will be me'alef klavim. The word for trainer, me'alef, will be singular, but the word for dog, kelev, will take the plural form, klavim. This is to indicate that the trainer trains more than one specific dog. In the same way, a window cleaner will be menakeh chalonot and not menakeh chalon. So far, it's not so bad, right? Well, now it's starting to get complicated. If the main noun is feminine, singular, and ends with the letter he, then the he becomes tough. Like in this example of the compound cheesecake, uga plus gvina, ugat gvina. Another issue is the plural form of these compounds. Like in English, when multiplying the compound, only one of the nouns takes the plural form, the main one. Therefore, if we want to say cheesecakes, we will not say ugot gvinot, but rather ugot gvina. If the main noun is masculine and plural, the plural masculine ending im becomes a. Notice that the nikud appears on the letter just before the yud. We'll use our first example again. If we want to say water bottles, the plural form of bakbuk, bakbukim, will turn into bakbuke, like so. Bakbukim plus main. Bakbuke main. Another rule the smichot is altering is the prefix ha, which means the. As you may know, when turning an indefinite noun into definite, we add the prefix ha to the noun itself and also to the adjective it has. For example, the big bottle will be habakbuk hagadol. However, in smichot compounds, only the describing noun gets the prefix ha. Like so, bakbuk hamaim, the water bottle. Lastly, there is one more issue, perhaps the most confusing one. Sometimes the vowels of the first noun change, like in these examples. Cheder plus ochel, chadar ochel, dining room, bait plus kele, bait kele, jailhouse. Most Hebrew speakers don't know the complicated rules for this unique construct. They simply learned how to use it when acquiring the language growing up. For Hebrew learners, it's definitely harder to learn these exceptions. But the more Hebrew you hear and speak, the more natural it will become. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later on. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher. Well, I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, which are the most common Hebrew greetings? Like any other language, Hebrew has many greetings that native speakers use all the time. In this lesson, we'll learn some of the most common ones. The first one is 
תתחדש. The expression תתחדש is said to someone who just bought or got something new. It can be anything from a haircut to a new house. This expression comes from the word חדש, meaning new. And its literal translation is something like you shall be renewed. There is no natural translation in English. If you want to say the same expression to a woman, you'll say תתחדשי. If you want to use it to greet more than one person, you'll use the plural form, תתחדשו. The next expression is כל הכבוד. כל הכבוד literally means all the respect. You can say it to someone in order to show your appreciation for an achievement they've made, big or small. It means something like well done or way to go. Unlike תתחדש, this expression doesn't change according to the person you're speaking to. An example would be העברית שלך טובה מאוד, כל הכבוד. Your Hebrew is very good, way to go. The next expression is very useful. It's said a few times every day, בתיאבון. בתיאבון literally means with appetite and is the Hebrew equivalent of the French bon appetit. You'll hear it from waiters in restaurants and from hosts presenting a dish. And you can use it when eating with other people right before taking the first bite. If you happen to sneeze around Hebrew speakers, you'll hear the next expression. La briout. La briout literally means to health. It's the Hebrew version of the English bless you and the Yiddish zum gesund. You can use it whenever somebody sneezes. Try using these expressions whenever you can. It will make your Hebrew sound more natural. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later. Later. Hi everybody, Edit here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, is it true that Hebrew was a dead language for centuries? Actually, Hebrew was never dead. It just ceased to be a spoken language. But let's start from the beginning. Historically, Hebrew is regarded as the language of the Israelites and their ancestors, and was a spoken language in the kingdoms of Israel and Judah from about 1200 BCE. Hebrew had ceased to be an everyday spoken language somewhere between 200 and 400 CE, declining since the Bar Kokhva revolt. However, it survived into the medieval period as the language of Jewish liturgy, rabbinic literature, and poetry. Since the Bible is written in Hebrew, all the Jewish people around the world could read and understand it. In the 18th century, the Jewish community in Jerusalem was composed of Sephardic Jews who spoke Ladino or Arabic, and Ashkenazi Jews who spoke Yiddish. In order to communicate, they needed a common language, so they created the early version of spoken Hebrew. However, it still wasn't a native language, but a basic way to communicate. The literary Hebrew was renewed in Europe starting from the 18th century by a Jewish movement that decided Hebrew was deserving of fine literature. Hebrew writers of the time wanted to write essays, poems, and novels, and to translate European literature and science books. However, they realized it's very hard to write about contemporary topics in a language that has been frozen in time so they had to find a way to update the language's vocabulary. Thus, biblical language was combined with figures of speech and vocabulary from the rabbinic literature, together with vocabulary and syntax found in European languages and Semitic languages such as Arabic and Aramaic. Another important contribution to the Hebrew language was made in the 12th and 13th centuries by a Jewish family of rabbis who translated Jewish writing from Arabic to Hebrew. The Arabic language, which belongs to the same language family as Hebrew, made an important contribution to the revival of the language. In the 19th century, Hebrew writers began arriving in Palestine, influencing the development of spoken Hebrew. Hebrew schools were built and Hebrew was used in public activities and eventually became the language used by the Jewish population in Israel. This process was aided by many organizations that saw Hebrew as an ideological purpose. Today, the spoken Hebrew in Israel is called Israeli Hebrew or modern Hebrew. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Great thought! Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what are some common Hebrew idioms? Every language has its everyday idioms. In English, for example, we have idioms like, what's up? or, it's raining cats and dogs. In this lesson, you learn some everyday Hebrew idioms. The first one is, lidhof et af. It literally means pushing or shoving one's nose. As you can probably guess, it means to meddle in other people's business. The next one is la sotsipu. It literally means to make a story. 
and it's used like the idiom to make a big deal in English. For example, Alta semi a sipu. Don't make a big deal out of it. The next idiom has to do with superstition. Riftoch pela satan. It literally means to open one's mouth to the devil. It originated from the Jewish prohibition against saying bad things about yourself or other people. Today, however, it's used in a similar way to the expression don't tempt fate. Don't say good things because you might jinx your luck. For example, אני חושבת שאני אעבור את המבחן, אבל אני לא רוצה לפתוח פה לשטן. I think I'll pass the exam, but I don't want to tempt fate. Our last idiom represents a life philosophy. Bali. It literally means, comes to me. But it means something like, I want, with a whimsical edge to it. A lot like the expression, I feel like. It was considered a children's idiom, but quickly became common among people of all ages. You can use it with nouns like, Bali pizza, I feel like eating pizza. Or with verbs like, Lo bali lalecht la'avoda, I don't feel like going to work. Note that this is a slightly cheeky expression, so you shouldn't use it in formal situations or with people you don't really know. It can come off as rude. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Lay thought! Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what are the differences between all the adverbs that mean really and very in Hebrew? There are a few adverbs that can mean very or really, and this can be somewhat confusing. In this lesson, we'll review some of the most common ones to clear things up. The most basic one, which is the most accurate equivalent of very, is me'od. Like any other adverb in Hebrew, me'od should come after the adjective it refers to. However, due to the influence of English and other languages, in colloquial use, it can appear before the adjective. It's very simple. For example, let's look at the two ways to say a very big house, using the word me'od. Bait gadol me'od. Bait me'od gadol. Our next word is mamash. The adverb mamash means really, truly, or very. For example, really good could be mamash tov. In colloquial speech, it can also precede the word no to mean absolutely not or no way. Mamash lo. The next adverb is be'emet. It literally means in truth and is used to make sure something is true or real. For example, is it really you in the picture? Would be, ze be'emet atabat muna? Unlike any of the previous words in this lesson, this word can also stand alone. You can ask, be'emet? When you hear something surprising like, there's a bear in the kitchen. Be'emet? Our next adjective is a lot like the word most, be'yoter. The adverb be'yoter comes after the adjective. When it comes after a definite adverb, it means the most, like in the biggest house, habayit hagadol be'yoter. When it comes after a verb or an indefinite adverb, it means quite, very much, like in a very big house, bayit gadol be'yoter. The next word is the colloquial version of be'yoter. Hachi. This adverb means the most and will always come before the adjective, like so. Hachi gadol, the biggest. Hachi chacham, the smartest. Our last word is one you may have heard before, nora. This word can be either an adjective meaning terrible or an adverb meaning terribly that can be used together with negative or positive adjectives. Like me'od, it can appear either before or after the adjective, like this. נורא טעים, terribly tasty. מפחיד נורא, terribly scary. Adverbs can make your sentence much more expressive, so try and use them. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. They thought. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what are the meanings of some of Hebrew's unique greetings? Hebrew has special greetings for different occasions. Let's take a closer look at some of them. We'll start with the very useful greeting, which means good luck. Behatzlacha. It literally means with success, as if to say, may you complete your task with success. 
You can say to a person to wish them good luck with a test, a job interview, a new project, or any other goal they wish to achieve. For example, if your friend got promoted and you want to wish him or her good luck with their new job, you can say, or simply, The next expression can be heard around dinner tables, in pubs, and at parties. It means cheers and it's used as a toast when drinking with company. The literal meaning of lechaim is to life, reminding us that life itself should always be celebrated. Lechaim. This next expression can come in handy when celebrating a happy occasion such as a wedding, engagement, childbirth, graduation, and so on. When someone congratulates you, you can answer Bekarovitz lecha, literally meaning soon so shall it be by you. For example, if you just got engaged to your girlfriend and a single friend congratulates you, you can reply with Toda, Bekarovitz lecha. To a female friend, you will say Bekarovitz lech. The last expression is a famous one. You may know it since it came from Yiddish and was adopted by English as well. You may know it as Mazal Tov, and in Hebrew it's Mazal Tov. It literally means good luck, but is used as congratulations. This expression was originally meant to declare that a good thing had happened. It was said at weddings and births as if to say, what a lucky event has happened. With time, the meaning was altered a little, and today this expression is used to wish a person luck in the future. You can use it whenever you want to congratulate someone, on a new job, winning an award, graduating from university, and so on. For example, Mazal tov leyom ha'uledet, literally, congratulations for your birthday. Or, Mazal tov al-azchiyah b'makom ha'rishon, congratulations on winning the first place. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hey Trot! Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where well, I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, can you use adjectives as nouns in Hebrew? In Hebrew, it's possible to omit the noun and use its adjective instead. To explain how it's done, let's look at some examples. Let's say you're at a clothing store looking for a new shirt. You've tried on a few, and now you need to decide which shirt to buy. Eventually, you decide on a red one. You can tell the salesperson, I'll take the red shirt. But since it's obvious the subject here is the shirt, you can simply say, I'll take the red one. Unlike English, when the word shirt is omitted, it's not replaced by another noun or one. The adjective itself functions as a noun. It's important to note that the adjectives you use has to match the gender of the original noun. The word for shirt in Hebrew, chultza, is feminine. So the adjective red, adom, took its feminine form, aduma. If you were to buy a hat instead of a shirt, you would have to match the adjective to the gender of the masculine word hat, kova, and say adom. Likewise, if you want to refer to an item that has the plural form, like flowers, socks, or glasses, you'll use the plural form for the adjectives, adumim or adumot. Let's put it all in one example. Let's say you run into a friend you haven't seen for a long time and ask how are her four children doing. She gives you a quick update on them. The older son is an actor, the middle daughter goes to university, and the young ones are still in school. If she were to say that in Hebrew, her sentences would have been much shorter, since the subject is her children and the adjectives explain the gender and the quantity of the nouns, she will not have to say son, daughter, or ones, because all the information is included in the adjectives. Here is the Hebrew sentence. Hagadol sachkan, haemtzeit lomedet ba'universita, v'aktanim adayin bevet sefer. Hebrew adjectives help you keep your sentences short and sweet. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. See you in another lesson. Let's go!